This panel is Luca Alicia Gabrielcic, who is a PhD candidate at the Central European University in Budapest, also a member of the ERC sponsored research group negotiating modernity. Uh, he holds a BA in history and Italian law topology from the University of Ljubljana and a BA uh, MA uh, from uh, in comparative history of Central Eastern and South Southeastern Europe from the Central European. Uh, University. He was a research fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Sofia, and uh, as I've said, he's now working on his PhD uh, in Budapest. Uh, his research interests include cultural history, intellectual history of nationalism, and the history of political thought in East Central uh, Europe, Spain, and Italy. Luca was actually supposed to present his uh, topic in the last panel of the of yet last yesterday's last panel uh, but due to logistical problems was replaced uh, by by Kari and now uh, he has the, this uh, task of being or in order of being the last speaker uh, of the day and of the conference. Thank you very much. Uh, yes indeed I'm the I'm the last presenter in this conference so I, but I, I think I think at least I am Addressing an issue which is of, you know, usually of great amusement uh, to people, is also my experience in uh, teaching MAs that when this issue comes to the foreground, everybody kind of uh, wakes up uh, again. There <laughs> is of course the issue uh, of national of national character of national characterology, and I think that everybody who and you know there are some among you who are familiar with the Slovenian public sphere and let's say the. Uh, the journalistic discourse and the political discourse will, sh will surely know that national character and national characterology is actually a topos, a stream which is extremely strong in the public discourse um, to a pathological degree even. Uh, you know, even when I ventured into, into writing some op-eds a couple of years ago, a friend of mine ironically commented, if you run out of topics to address, you can always write something about the Slovenian national character and that will go. So, um, my, my, my question here, and I've been interested uh, in this for a long time, is how come uh, that so specific and unusual topic, no, 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 that's not a topic, but the way in which it's written, because we are here dealing with a very peculiar type of national characterology, which is not about extolling the nation, right? Not even so much as to point out its particularities regarding the others, but it's sort of kind of self-denigrating, self-critical, uh, kind of passepartout explanation of the pathologies of, uh, of the polity, which is then transferred to, to kind of individuals' pathology, pathologies of the, uh, of the uh, let's say, uh, members of the nation. So where does this come from? And I think, of course, the first step to make, to kind of distance oneself from this sort of like, even toxic, uh, let's say, literal paradigm, is to have this, this step backward and see that paradigm itself as a literary tradition, right? So the people who are engaging in this, writing in this, they're not actually writing about the national character, but they are right, situated, even, in, even if they don't know about it, within a certain literary tradition. And, you know, this narrative would then find the, let's say, the, the father of this paradigm in, in the Slovenian uh, case, which would be the uh, the modernist author Ivan Zankar, and then the explanation would go, of course, like since since the modern since modern Slovenian literature was founded by Zankar, and since Zankar was so much obsessed with with writing, let's say, the pathologies of his society into personal reflections, which were then interpreted as a sort of national characterology. Therefore, it's natural that, or, that or, let's say uh, the literary tradition afterwards followed his path. And of course, then those uh, with, with more erudite knowledge would recognize that this actually doesn't come from Sankar directly, this tradition, but it comes from the um, interpretation, the reception of Sankar's work in the interwar period, especially by a group of um, young uh, leftist Christians intellectuals from the interwar period who were both uh, uh, trying to formulate a left wing critique. But also national critique, uh, stressing the, the emancipation of the Slovenian strongly Yugoslav framework. Uh, the central figure here would be uh, Edvard Kozbek. And it is from Kozbek's interactions with the communists, 
uh, I said, the, the, the notion of national character that he develops is a way for him to enter in discussion with, with the communists who have this idea of the new man. And um, with, out of this dialect, then you have um, in, the, in 1941 the, the, the fundamental points of the, of the, the liberation front of the Slovenian people, the famous fourth, uh, uh, the fourth uh, uh, point is that the role of the, of the anti-fascist resistance of the, of the liberation front of the Slovenian people is actually to change the Slovenian national character. Um, so that actually, that in, in that moment, in, 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 the, in the world that period, that ceases to be a literary, literary topos, right? And becomes, you know, an important political factor, which is right? actually having a, uh, uh, a blueprint which has in its fourth point the change of the national uh, now, this historization it's, it's useful enough and it's not done, uh, it's not done very often. Um, but I think it, it, uh, it, still, it, still misses, it still misses the broader picture. Because what it does, it then it pathologizes, just like makes uh, just one step of pathologizing. So instead of pathologizing you know, the Slovenians and the, and, the, and the society and how it works, it pathologizes its own national, its own literary tradition, right? It says, well, it's not about, it's not that the Slovenians are, you know, they have all these pathologies and these problems, and that's why they cannot be fully modernized, but it's that we have, like, a bad literary tradition, and, you know, we have certain figures which are, were obsessed with, with their own pathology, and then they extrapolated it to the nation. Uh, I think it's, it's useful here to actually have another step backward and realize that even these, these kind of, uh, this whole tradition, and not only this whole tradition, but, but the, the, the paradigm changes with this, within this tradition, can actually be traced uh, into a broader picture of, let's say, development of, of Western thought, and especially the peripheries of Western thought. Because if we look for that pers from that perspective, we, re we realize that uh, discussions and, and ideas about national, national character and national characterology have a quite long tradition in Western thought. And we can we could trace it back, uh, you know, to the Greek uh, theory of the humor, or the humors. Uh, you can find it, you know, in all possible Renaissance texts, and then you find it yet again in uh, in the Enlightenment. You know, just suffice it to think that that, that Kant wrote about the, the different nation, uh, characters of different European peoples, um, and all and all this is true. And I will not. This is an important prehistory of that largely forgotten trend in European thought. But I think I could tell that something happens within this tradition uh, in the post in the post positive positivist uh, period. That, that is to say, during the uh, the fond secular period, where especially in peripheral countries, not only across Europe, but you can actually trace that all the way to Mexico, which is actually a quite important uh, a quite important chapter in this in this story. Uh, National characterology emerges again as a specific, not not anymore as uh, let's say, not anymore as embedded in this um, kind of positivist tradition of of ethnology and ethnography and of of, of of objectively tracing out how different peoples behave and how they you know what, what it, how they interact historically and so on and so forth, but it becomes a sort of kind of self self psychologization which has a very strong let's say uh, collective collective element as well and this is I think quite obviously connected with the reception of what you know what happens in the form secular crisis of the positive sciences uh, the emergence of psychology as the new science of of, uh, of man which on one hand is of course the outbirth of the old positive paradigm but it's also so deeply subversive of, of, of this uh, paradigm. You know, that we know all these all this things, right? It's when, you know, this is the, the, famous, the famous quote that this is when a man ceases to be the master even if he's in his own uh, home, um, where um, the very idea of the, 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 very, the very idea that it could be an objective knowledge of society kind of starts uh, entering in a, in a big crisis. But on the other side, this also offers this sort of behind this classical pessimism of the form of secular period, so really to describe it as a pessimism of historians like Kapschowski uh, in his form of secular Vienna. But on the other side, of course, this opens also another, another uh, window of opportunity, because 
with this notion of natural character, actually science ceases to be entirely objective and becomes, again, opens up this whole space of, of subjective expression. So the entire, say, the, the entire fate of the nation resides in the individual, especially given the artist, the writer, um, who, who through self-knowledge can actually st uh, tell, uh, again, uh, you know, after the romantic, the romantic, the, the romantic period, again, can actually start uh, having a very strong collective, uh, collective message. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, and in, within this context, we, what you find is that in the late, uh, around the 1890s and, and, uh, and between the 1890s and the 1910s, we have a whole series of literature which is very similar in its peculiarity all across, let's say, the peripheral, peripheral uh, regions. The most famous probably is the, uh, the Spanish generation of uh, 1998, which is uh, you know, a mixture of, of positive positives scholars of one hand and the writers who uh, start thinking about this dysfunctionality of their own society uh, on one hand by rigorous social critique, but on the other hand also by uh, fishing up the, the figure of, of uh, Don Quixote as a paradigmatic uh, figure of the, of the problems of, of the Spanish character. You find it then uh, in, uh, in, in, in Bulgaria with, with famous authors like Alec uh, 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 Constantino with his uh, uh, famous book on uh, Baigano, which is for sort of a uh, Bulgarian Hashex. That, that, that say this is sort of ironic, ironic critique of society, right? Um, and you find this uh, similar sort of literature in Romania with Ion Luca Caracciale and his criticism of the, uh, of the liberal uh, or liberal conservative Romanian order, again through this sort of ironic works which actually try to see, try to point out how the, the basic the social structures are shaky and dysfunctional because they're based on a, uh, on a national character, because they're based on civil subjects whose character is not taken into account. And of course, basically, you know, um, uh, Jaroslav Hasek's famous uh, soldier Schweig will actually be seen as part of that, of that, of that little tradition. Now, um, what I was thinking, what is actually, if we think of these works also as, as, which I think they are, as a sort of a political critique, what could we find in common? How would, could we, you know, they're, they, they're the logical, very, very diverse. Karajala, for example, comes from a conservative, conservative tradition. You have Hasha, who's basically, you know, an uh, uh, anti-political. Uh, you have the same sort of literature a little bit later, though, in, in Mexico, which comes from a leftist, uh, leftist uh, position. What do they have in common? And I think that one of the ways we can describe what, what, what they think has in common is that basically they are, um, they are trying, to, they're using this, this critical national characterology um, to criticize um, what, what could be called as the dis dysfunctional modernization of their societies, right? And this is not directed, this is, an ex, um, this is a typically internal critique. It's not, it's not uh, to this type of, of national characterology, it's, it's not uh, focused into distinguishing, into kind of, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not focused in the issue of how, you know, my nation is different from the other, but it's, it's much more internal critique, and it's internal critique of what it's seen as a dysfunctional or rather superficial modernization by usually an already modernizing uh, of that is of, of a modernizing elite. So not a pre-modern elite, but of, 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 of a modern elite. And that's you know you can see that in Spain, which the main criticism is the system of, of uh, restoration, which is after all uh, you know a, a modernist uh, system. You can see that in Mexico with the criticisms. The Porfirato, which you know, it's, it 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 frames itself as a positivist, modernizing uh, paradigm. That's clear in the Romanian case, and that's also clear to come back to the Slovenian case with Ivan Zankar. I think that we, if we place Ivan Zankar in that in, in, in that context, we see that suddenly this extremely weird thing that he's doing, right, with his text, 
it starts to make, to make sense. Just like, for example, Constantino in, in Bulgaria, uh, Sankar, uh, Sankar uh, subverts the previous canon of, of, of but the national character, the extolling tradition of the national characterology, which is mm -hmm, very dispersed, uh, fragmented, and he, he, he basically unwillingly canonizing by, by its own subversion. So, uh, this is, you know, uh, that's in the, in the classical, uh, in the classical uh, rhetorical tradition, this would be called a paradiaspora, when you actually re-describe a certain, a certain uh, virtue as a vice, with a neighboring vice, or re-describe a vice with a neighboring virtue, and that's, that's what he does, for example, right? The classical narrative that the Slovenians are uh, meek and simple and loyal, they suddenly become, from his perspective, meekness becomes spinelessness, loyalty becomes lack of independence, uh, kind of a communal spirit becomes conformism, and so on and so forth, right? And then, of course, if, if we uh, take a step backward, we realize that this red description, this paradiastolic uh, uh, um, uh, stretch that, he's, that he employs in his work, it's what it does is basically re-describe the old, let's say, the national characterology which was made to function within an imperial framework, right? The, the, the virtues which are, um, um, which are kind of positive within large and imperial framework, loyalty, uh, meekness, right? The, 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 the power can, all, can always rely uh, on, on this loyal nation, become, become negative because in the background you still have Kind of a national uh, emancipatory uh, emancipatory project, which is pessimistic, nevertheless, which doesn't, uh, which criticizes the, the naive optimism of the of the petty bourgeois liberal elites as um, hopelessly hopelessly naive, uh, and, 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 and 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 kind of makes a sort of, sort of tries to make a sort of psychological microhistory to show how this doesn't work out and how, how on, the, kind of, uh, on the level beyond the, uh, the, 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 uh, the flamboyant rhetorics of nationalism actually this doesn't, this doesn't work out and creates just new, new sets of, of, uh, of uh, oppression basically now the, the, uh, the national elites are the real, uh, the real oppressors. Now, um, I don't think that actually it's some kind of that what he does is 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 really national characterology from, um, and I think he doesn't just basically he he um, is not really interested in the individual. He's not really interested in that sense in in uh, kind of taking out the paradigmatic Slovenian and, and dissecting what's wrong with him. Basically, what he does, he always thinks in terms of society and and. I think that even if you look at most of his pragmatic texts, which are now later re-inscribed as being, uh, as being uh, works on national um, characterology, they are much more uh, analysis on how power, um, power works in the, in the, on, the, on the micro level. What happens is that, is that already, um, it already contains a lot of elements that then later on, in the interwar period, uh, could be re-inscribed, could be re-described as a sort of critical uh, ontological uh, national characterology. For example, um, uh, I think that, okay, just to, to shorten it up, um, the most important one is that for Sankar, the solution is not anymore really social reform. And not even, that's, I think it's read later uh, into it, not even social revolution, but the solution, if, if the pathology is not necessarily personal, the, the solution is personal, right? Uh, only through kind of a personal ethical polygenesis, the nation can be reborn. And through that, it can actually become a subjectivity. And if you put it like this, then you can see that although it's not, it's not the sort of, of ontolog ontolog ontological, it's not, so this national ontology doesn't form part of a certain uh, national metaphysics, that the elements in which the interwar period it could be re-described uh, uh, as such uh, are all already there. Um, so I think I should conclude now, right? Uh, obviously, uh, unfortunately, I will not be uh, able to describe what happens in the interwar period, but I think that um, the move that happens then in the 1920s and 1930s, in which Sankar is, is taken from being, let's say, an, an ironic, idiosyncratic, personal, 
author who is very much interested in the cracks within, you know, the cracks of power and in, in, you know, micro, uh, uh, micro terminology, micro power. The move into which he, he, he becomes like the uh, author who, you know, saw into the national character. Uh, this is also not uh, specific to Slovenian movie. It's the same thing was brilliantly, I think, described by Alexander Kiosev, happens in, in Bulgaria, where the critical literature of the interwar period is sort of uh, Hashekian uh, characters, then become um, a source of a discussion, at least, a critique, discussion, become a field into which, in the interwar period, um, uh, national, kind of ontological national characterology emerges. The same happens in, uh, in Romania, where, you know, Karajada's critical, critical irony of, of the Romanians has, uh, in the West, we, we, uh, we of course know Eugenio Ionesco and, and his, uh, his, let's say, uh, interpretation of Karajada, but it has also a whole other uh, right wing uh, nationalist, uh, national, national metaphysics, which, which is less known but much more important, unfortunately. Political. And of course, there is there is, and I would include with that, it's of course the the, the the Spanish examples, which is, by the way, very influential in the uh, in the in the winter war period, both in Southeastern South Europe and Central Europe, and uh, in Mexico, um, whereby uh, the critical deconstructive, uh, ironic uh, uh, works are redescribed uh, as sort of. Uh, the quest for national ontology, which is, which is the pragmatic example of Don Quixote, right? Uh, uh, who counterintuitively becomes uh, suddenly a kind of a source of, of discussion about national metaphysics. And I will conclude with a, with a quote by the uh, Colombian uh, philosopher Gomez Davila, um, who wrote, who, by, by, uh, when he was reading this, this Spanish of literature from the 1920s and 1930s, to try to kind of figure out what the Spanish soul is on the basis of what he called it, he said. Um, it is actually Cervantes' fault. Uh, it, it is actually Cervantes himself who bears the responsibility for the insipid, sometimes outright idiotic interpretation of his work. For he wrote an ironic, canonic book for a people without irony. And I think this is, this is what happens with, with, uh, national, with, with the issue of national cartology very often. And not to fall into national cartology, I think this is basically a much more a fault of a certain, uh, it's a literary tradition based to recognize the original ironic and multifaceted, uh, multifaceted character uh, from which this initial national cartology. Was.